And that's what climate change is about. It is literally, not figuratively, a clear and present danger. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction. The ability of CO2 to do the heavy work of creating a climate catastrophe is almost nil at this point. The price of oil has been artificially elevated to the point of insanity. That's not how you power a modern industrial system. The ultimate goal of this renewable energy you know, plan is to reach the exact same point that we're at now. You know who's tried that? Germany. Seven straight days of no wind for Germany. Uh, their factories are shutting down. They really do act like weather didn't happen prior to like 1910. Today is Friday. Today is Friday. Hello and welcome to Climate Change Roundtable. You know, I, I literally as we start here, I got a comment that came in that says, uh, they hope that the Heartland crew is ready for the record coming white global warming event. I assume that means there's a massive snowstorm coming, which I'm totally yeah, unaware of. Yeah, Buffalo is going to be buried under about five feet of snow. Is it, okay. Well, uh, thank you, Abel Windsor, for you know the notification that that's coming, because I, I was totally unprepared for it. But uh, yes, this is Climate Change Roundtable, and joining me today is most of the usual crew. We have Anthony Watts and some remote. Anthony, where are you? <laughs> I'm uh, near Cincinnati, Ohio right now, and uh, I'm visiting family this weekend, but uh, I've commandeered the hotel's network <laughs> and uh, got a decent signal through. Unfortunately, yeah. our colleague Sterling is having all kinds of technical problems with his uh, computer and network, so he may not be able to join us today. Yeah, well, we, we hope uh, he'll figure it out. Obviously, he's an expert at computers and everything technological. He did once tell me that technology peaked in 1970s and only gotten worse since. So I'm sure I'm sure he's going to figure this one out. And uh, Linnea, you seem to enjoy that comment. Um, how are you doing today? I'm doing all right. Uh, looks nothing like Christmas in the low country here, but it is starting to feel like it a little bit. Um, I am really stubborn. I decided I am not going to turn my heater on unless the like daytime high is in the like 40s. Um, but it is in the low 50s today. Um, uh, it might get warmer, but I woke up this morning uh, yeah. feeling like I probably should be able to see my breath inside of my own house. So yeah, it's <laughs> not that I'm really complaining because I know Chicago is a lot worse. But That's what I'm going to say. Oh, you know, you're just not doing your part on. to burn enough fossil fuels. I'm disappointed. <laughs> I know. Well, I had a fire in my uh, fireplace last night, which was really oh, okay. Nice. There you go. Um, and that puts plenty of uh, um, oh, little, what is it, PM two point five? Yeah, <laughs> and all sorts of good stuff into the air. So um, we'll see. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, in Chicago, forty degrees is like summer weather for me. But you know, if that's if that's what what you consider cold uh come back uh venture back to my time actually no don't venture back it's terrible here but uh all right so this week we're kind of discussing uh cop 27 has been going on and the alarmist claims coming out are let's just say more than doubling in magnitude so um before we get to all of it the united nations did put out a video just kind of uh you know I'll, let me play the video and you all can determine um what you think so here it is Um, there we go. Scientists point out that women and children will be the worst hit by climate change, despite the few that have received If we fool ourselves, if we think we can fool nature, because nature always strikes back. Eyes of all future All right, there's so many things I want to say about that video. But first, uh, Anthony, Linnea, 
Anything striking that just that just you have to comment on well, first. Catering to the gullible. That's basically what this video mm -hmm. is all about. It's lots of fast moving pictures, quick edits, you know, pictures of disaster, pictures of people that are obviously going to suffer from that disaster. It basically it's, you know, if you're stupid, this video really hits home for you. Yeah. Um, Linnea, did, I, did you have any striking takeaways from this? Really nice production quality. I, I mean, as someone those team. videos for Harley, nice. I, I felt that too. Even though it, Anthony's right, it's so quick. It's like aggressively quick cuts. Um, all right, yeah. so let me skip to the skip to the end because there was. Well, they had to pack. It, it, it's it's called it's called disaster packing, and they had to fit all the possible disasters in that short time frame. You know, that's what they were doing. They were disaster packing. When when you're disaster packing for climate change, I feel like you have a billion different things to cover if you go by all the things that they've claimed, but. Here's what I actually found to be the most interesting part. So it says something along the lines of uh, bold leaders and innovators are acting now for their countries, their businesses and their families. We urge you to join them. So like the ultimate message of this video is like, hey, there's, you know, leaders out there like us, the, the people at COP27, global elites, do what we say, like, join us. We know what you should do. <laughs> And it, it just yeah. kind of seemed like it was this giant video of like, here's all the horrible things that happen unless you do what we tell you to do. And uh, yeah. I don't know, uh, that was that was kind of like I, when I got to the end, that part was just like, huh, this is a little dystopian to me. Yeah. Um, it's basically yeah. what, the, what this was produced in 2019. There was a, a report that came out in 2019 called, uh, you know, the the U.N. emissions gap report. And basically what they said was, is that, well, you know, we did Paris Agreement and the Paris Agreement basically turned into well, that's not good enough. That 1.5 degree, we're not going to hit it. It's actually going to hit 3.2 unless we act now. And that's basically what happened. And so now they're pushing this act now because, oh, my goodness, Paris wasn't good enough. It's going to get even worse. And so they're trying to basically, they were pushing that at the most recent COP27 because, you yeah. know, the other COP26 meetings didn't do anything. And so, you know, this is our enough. last chance. This is our last chance. We have to act now. And so, you know, they're into that whole mode of disaster disaster packing and then we end up with this kind of stuff so but here's the thing i want to show you a graph about yep. carbon dioxide most people think that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and warming is a linear thing that you know basically it just goes straight up like that but it's not like that at all it's a completely different animal it's not linear it's logarithmic and as a result the effect of increasing carbon dioxide diminishes as it gets more and more in the atmosphere. Andy, do you have that graph available? Yep. I'm pulling it up right now. One moment. Okay. So here's the thing. Most people, I would say 99.5, maybe higher, don't understand that um, the relationship between carbon dioxide and warming in the atmosphere is not linear. The media portrays it as le being linear. A yeah, lot of the scientists important. even portray it as being linear, but the real deal is that it's logarithmic. And anybody who understands, you know, high school math will understand <laughs> logarithmic. But this graph here basically shows that in the first 20 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, that's where the greatest amount of warming occurs. We get almost two and a half degrees of warming in the first 20 parts per million. And then as you add more, keep doubling it, you know, you got 20, 40, 60, 100 the effect diminishes as we get to today up to around 420 parts per million we're getting you know less than a less than one degree of warming associated or less than a tenth of a degree of warming associated with that and as we go higher and higher and higher it diminishes even further and so this this disaster that they are portraying for the future is absolutely totally false it's not going to happen related to carbon dioxide and no matter how much you you diminish your emissions it's not going to make any difference. And this is why when we had uh, the Paris Agreement, you know, we had calculations of how much difference mm -hmm. is the Paris Agreement going to make if everybody adheres to it. And it was, you know, like a couple hundredths of a degree. The whole thing's bogus. Yeah. yeah. Um, Linnea, I don't know if you noticed it in here in Sterling. Glad to see that you're back. Hopefully your Internet's working. But they show pre-industrial times atmospheric CO2 concentrations. And then what concentrations are as a, you know, I guess it's a little behind today, but modern time CO2 concentrations and just like the minimal impact that it's it's going to have at increasing uh, atmospheric CO2. It's 
it's almost like they act as if you know it's the first 20 parts per million and then and then just ignore the rest of this relationship yeah well and i would i guarantee that probably 99 percent of people don't know that this is the case oh yeah and this is the case with not just carbon dioxide, but every gas in the atmosphere. None of them have a linear impact on any kind of um, absorption or radiation. Um, yeah. But that's not something that's taught in school. They, and I, I'm skeptical that it really could be in a um, at a lower level, like in high school or something, most people don't go on and do a whole lot of college level science. Nah. Um, and even me who, who did take a geochemical cycles course in college, I don't think that we did this. <laughs> I could be wrong, but when we added carbon dioxide to our little models, when we were making our own little climate models, uh, there was no factor of decreasing impact, um, per, uh, really? concentration. So, it's, I think that they know it though. The, the scientists who study this stuff have to know that this is the case. And you do see that reflected in some of the IPCC reports when you dig really, really deep into them. Um, but it's not what's going to be in the executive summary and it's not going to be in the summary for policymakers. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, we, we reference IPCC data, you know, a good bit partially because that's the data that like everyone says, Oh, this is the IPCC. It's the official data. Like if you, if you don't, you know, reference it, you're just cherry picking or whatever. Like if you, it, 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 as you said, it is the summary for policymakers where they, they do the cherry picking or they just misrepresent what's in there and then have these doom and gloom stories in general. Sterling, I just, uh, can you hear us or, or is, uh, how is it? Are, are you, I just want to know if your internet's working. I'm going to take that as a no. <laughs> All right. I can so, hear you. Uh, I, hear you. I don't know if you can uh, hear me. Yes. Yeah. All right. I hear you there. I hear you there. Um, you did get into to oh, climate models a bit, I'm here, and, and hear you. Uh, sorry. What? <sighs> yeah, Sterling. It might. Uh, I I hate to say it, but it might just not work this week. Um. Yeah, it seems you're a bit behind. Uh, we'll see if it if it cleans itself up. But if not, uh, you know, pitfalls are going live. Uh. All right. So so. Anthony, um, or, or Lene, you sent an article to us this week from Rig Zone, and the let me I can pull it up here, but the final sentence of it uh, struck me as surprising, and it is related to this whole uh, 3.2 degrees Celsius increase in temperatures. So one moment here, um, and the reason I bring this up is I want to discuss where this figure is actually coming from. When did it jump from like 1.5 to 3.2? Uh, right. Yeah. And while you're searching for that, I'll just give people kind of a this this um, article that you're bringing up here cites it. Uh, this is something that Linnea found earlier in the week, and they're talking about, you know, the decarbonization agenda they're going to pursue. And they're basing that on yeah. this 3.2 degrees centigrade, you know, increase in temperature that they're expecting. Well, the problem with this is that it's all based on the RCP 8.5 model. That this model basically is has been has been um, debunked by science recently. Um, it actually came from within the science community, the climate science community. Zeke Hausfather wrote a paper, basically saying this RCP 8.5 that everybody's using because it's the worst case super disaster. Oh my God, we're going to die scenario. Uh, <laughs> basically, can't happen because even if we burned all the fossil fuels left on the planet, we would never get there. And yet this thing continues to be cited by scientists and media alike. Here it is. This was the curve out of this thing. And so you can see there the, in the red, the RCP 8.5 shows anywhere from 3.2 to 5.4 degrees centigrade of warming based on, mm -hmm. you know, the worst case projection. But that can't happen. It, we can't get there. It, the, the science has been clear on this, that you can't get there in this model. And this happened about two years ago when this paper was published. But, you know, a lot of people haven't gotten the memo. And so they're still chasing this kind of, oh, my God, we're going to die worst case scenario and in and believing it. And so they're trying to decarbonize yeah. the planet because they think that red one is going to be happening and it won't. 
Yeah, and I mean, the media will talk about the red one as if it's actually what is happening versus what the worst case scenario model, which is repeatedly proven wrong, is predicting, uh, which is an important distinction in and of itself. Um, so actually, I'm going to go back to the Rig Zone article for a second also, just because I wanted to discuss the idea that the global industrial decarbonization agenda has been set. So this is related to COP27 and uh, just how like it's world leaders got together kind of related to the video as well where it says kind of just follow us they've set an agenda and we will follow it so reading from the article the international renewable energy agency which is irena and its partners have defined the agenda for global industrial decarbonization the industrial sector is the second largest emitter after power generation accounting for more than 30 percent of global emissions and almost 40 percent of global energy consumption the target of limiting global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius remains out of reach without substantial industrial sector efforts to reduce emissions. Given the scale of today's net zero challenges, a single organization or industry sector does not have the solutions to tackle decarbonization alone. Industrial decarbonization requires cross-sector collaboration to strengthen demand for low carbon solutions throughout the entire value chain. Uh, Linnea, what does what does it mean when they say cross sector uh, collaboration across the entire chain? Uh, globalism, <laughs> cor corporate oligarchy, globalism. I guess uh, basically what they're saying is top down in every sector of the economy, from steel smelting to um, recovery of hydrocarbons. Of course, they want to stop that altogether. Um, manufacturing everything, they want it all to be decarbonized is the yep. word that they're using now, um, which means uh, all of that's not going to happen anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it's really most of the time when they when they pitch these kinds of ideas and they say that they're decarbonizing, um, let's use smelting as an example, because it's completely absurd that you can use winded solar uh, to do something like that, unless it's like direct heat solar. Yeah. And you're using the superheated like molten salt at the center of a of a reflector tower to to do some of this. But even then, I'm skeptical that it can be done. Um, but the uh, basically what they mean is that they're going to do like cap and trade or something. So they're going to continue to emit the same emissions, but then they're going to make someone else pay for it in some way or another or tell someone else that they can't uh, emit as much. And yeah. oftentimes today, what that takes the form of is pushing smaller companies out and the you end up with kind of a monopoly because they're the only ones that can afford the regulation. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, regulation the big is big companies, often... the regulation, it, it's good. It, same thing happened with, the, with a lot of the, um, the car industry, the electric car industry. You know, the smaller guys that made these new and unique cars couldn't handle all the regulation and they got pushed out. And so as a result, you know, Regulation is actually good for big business because it helps weed out your competition. Uh, yeah, I mean, this uh, this is related to literally every sector. Like, I love talking about this this topic, and I'll keep it as brief as possible. But when when um, minimum wage is like coming up uh, in in the legislative section uh, session, you'll see companies like Walmart push for it. You'll see Target. You'll see you'll see the biggest corporations out there. And I love Walmart. Walmart went to the most rural places like in the United States and gave them essential goods like clothes at a third of the price so i love walmart but they're out there like yes let's double minimum wage like people deserve more we got to give them a living it's not because walmart is you know just so caring for their employees it's because they know that small companies cannot uh actually pay those wages at this time and until they grow will fail and then eventually over time despite the short-term losses walmart will take in the long term They'll dominate the, the industry so they're using government regulation to take over it, it it's just another example of right. this in action and the same is true for like bp chevron exxon you name yeah. it these larger multinationals um use methane regulations and flaring regulations and whatnot they lobby for them in the government in order to push out the mom and pop shops that can't afford to install all the fancy yep. extra equipment that they need um yep. and what what ends up being funny is you talk to someone who is on the other side of this issue and they'll talk about big oil constantly. And I'm like, dude, big oil is on your team. <laughs> wholeheartedly. <laughs> they donate more money to your side than anything else. Yeah. 
Uh, I can see it. Uh, Sterling, can, can you hear us? Nope. All right. Sterling, if you can hear me, it, uh, just give up. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, no, I mean, it, that, that's just not many people understand that, that big corporations aren't the enemy of government. They're the government's best friend or, and vice versa. It's, it's small companies that, that suffer with these regulations as they um, as they're pushed. Um, all right. So going back here. Um, so what what the on September 1st, 2022, IRENA, which uh, IRENA, what was the acronym? The International Renewable Energy Agency uh, co-founded the partner Simeon's Energy. And companies across all industry sectors launched the Alliance for Industry Decarbonization at the G20 Investment Forum on Energy Transition in Bali, Indonesia. Established by adopting the Bali Declaration, the Alliance aims to support efforts to decarbonize industrial value chains, advance industry adoption of renewable-based solutions, and aid in the accomplishment of country-specific net zero goals. Country-specific was the part that uh, stuck out to me because the rest of the article gave no indication of what countries they're talking about. And, and I, I honestly sat there like wondering, um, does that mean the United States, China, I don't know, countries like us, we, we get to do whatever we want while we push third world countries to, to completely go net zero, which they kind of already are? Or does it mean that we're going to not allow those countries to go through industrial revolutions, uh, force them to use renewables, and essentially just destroy lives in the process? Oh. This is just pure, both. You think both? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, they, they don't say. They just say country specific. It was it was uh, a really interesting wording, Anthony. I mean, if you had to guess, I know this is just uh, uh, you know theorizing here, but what would you say they're they're going at? I'm sorry, what was the question? So uh, the last, I'm looking at this paragraph here. So the Bali Declaration, and what they say in it is that the alliance aims to support efforts to decarbonize industrial value chains. Advanced can you put industry. that? Can you put that up on the screen so I can read it? Oh yeah, you know I'm sorry about that. I thought it was on screen. My bad. Uh, so uh, thank you. There we go. So I'm looking at this paragraph here. Um, if you want to skip it, so the last part of it says, and this is related to the Bali Declaration, they're going to aid in the accomplishment of country-specific net zero goals. Yeah. The interesting thing is, like, okay. who does that mean? Well, that means whoever they decide to attack, pretty much. Um, and yeah. what what I see happening here is they'll say, well, country country X, you're not going to be able to meet your net zero goals and still maintain, you know, your standard of living or whatever. So you're going to have to pay reparations. Yes, indeedy, <laughs> it's reparations to those poor countries that you're hurting out there with that <laughs> nasty carbon dioxide you're emitting. So yeah. pony up, sucker, and send some money. That's what it's going to boil down to. I, I don't, I don't deny that at all. Um, so I mean, the group held their first meeting during COP27. So apparently, this is coming soon. Uh, let's see, anything else in here that's that pressing? Um, so members agreed during the discussions that partnerships built on peer-to-peer -peer communication and collaboration are essential for industry stakeholders to handle the issues of sustainable energy successfully and efficiently. Climate action needs industry leaders. This alliance stands for the growing commitment of global industry to act on decarbonization. We, we are delighted today to welcome eight new members to our alliance, united in their determination to speed up the energy transition. So, I mean, yeah, this is, this is just to paraphrase, we're inviting the most powerful people we can at COP27 that have the ability to work the levers of government to force you down the path we want to force you down. That that would that would be my if you know elevator pitch of what this article is saying, but uh, the final reason we we brought it up is and and this is where it surprised me, there are no reasons uh, or excuses to wait for action. All technologies needed are available, and the recent uh, IPCC report has made it clear that without major changes, global warming will increase more than 3.2 degrees Celsius. So uh, that. That was the part where I was surprised. I, I mean, even when the new IPCC report came out, I don't remember them claiming 3.2 too often. I mean, if I'm wrong here, correct me. No, you're not. Yeah, it just seems like they pulled that out of nowhere and, and are now just making it like it's it's the claim they've always said. Well, someone decided that 1.5 wasn't scary enough or 1.5 isn't going to be able to get the money extracted that we need for whatever the reason. And so they decided they they would create this 
the new idea called emissions gap, which is just basically another way of saying, we're not gonna get there unless you do X, Y, and Z. And so as a result, you ended up with this, basically this um, uh, scientifically backed extortion to basically say, you're gonna have to pay more money because we gotta get to 3.2, not 1.5. That, that's all it is. Yeah, and you know, you um, it's gonna be hard for me to show it on screen here, but you sent a section from that um, from that that uh report, which I believe you read all of, uh, that said essentially this: assuming that climate action continues consistently throughout the 21st century, a continuation of current policies would lead to a global mean temperature rise of 3.5 degrees Celsius by 2100. And then they say the range is from 3.4 to 3.9, and they assign a 66% probability to that. This corresponds roughly to a tripling of the current level of warming as assessed by the IPCC 2018 report. The current unconditional um, NDC, which is nationally determined contributions assessed in the report are consistent with limiting warming likely to 3.2 degrees Celsius. So now they're saying if we follow the Paris Accord perfectly, warming will only be 3.2 degrees Celsius, which is again, nothing they've said. It, it, until it's all right model based. Now. It's all it's all conjecture. It's all yep. future projections. There's no reality in any of this. Yep. It's there's no reality, and they're now just doubling everything they've said the past. I don't know, seven years, and just like not not at all mentioning the fact that that that's actually occurring. Uh. All right. So, and do you do you both have anything else you want to mention regarding this article, or moving on? <laughs> Now, I don't know what this is about. More feedback in the upper atmosphere. Um, if they're talking about the tropical hotspot, it's never showed up. Um, but there's not enough information in that comment to really know. Yeah. Um, also, as usual, uh, leave comments, questions. We we do our best to address them during the show, generally in the last 15 minutes. Um, it is somewhat times hard for us to track them all as we go live. So try to keep them in mind and get them up at the end. But uh, let's uh, let's see if there is anything interesting just for the moment. Um, let's see the whole aim of whoop, uh, one sec, Jim. I, I got it for the moment. <laughs> the whole aim of practical politics is to keep the populace alarmed and hence clamorous to be led to safety by menacing it with an endless series of hobgoblins, all of them imaginary. I mean, yeah. Um, Linnea, you want to take a stab at it? Uh, not really sure what you can add to that. Yeah, um, I would. Look at our favorite, our favorite uh, fiction, nonfiction book, State of Fear by Michael Crichton, right. um, which is a lot wordier version of the sentence. <laughs> um, basically, the idea is yeah. that uh, they pump up the climate argument. Um, but one of the interesting things in that book is that everyone who is not a like on the ground foot soldier type activists, but the people who coordinate this stuff for all the legal battles and everything, they are well aware of the um, contradictions in the data compared to what it is that they're actually saying is happening. Um, yeah. And it's about them trying to manipulate that <laughs> uh, and also do some fun science fiction weather alteration <laughs> type of stuff. So uh, it's a great book if you guys want to read that. Um, but this isn't a new concept. I mean, the idea that people will be forever haunted by some kind of apocalypse that's looming um, in order to keep them in line is a tale as old as time, right? Especially when it comes oh, yeah. to uh, overarching um, and unfalsifiable kind of uh apocalypse like the climate issue yep yeah stay if it gets warmer climate if it gets colder climate that's why right and in 100 years 100 years from now none of us are here so if it warms by you know a quarter of a degree in 100 years but they keep promoting every single year that it's going to be three degrees four degrees five degrees well no one's going to check them on it they're just yeah. going to keep pushing it like in the 70s when we we're supposed to be in an ice age by now I mean, yeah, right. we mention it all the time, but no one holds anyone to account for that kind of prediction. Yeah, um, I mean, that uh, we haven't really talked about this much, and I'm not going to go into too much detail about it, but we, we did just do a poll. Um, and, and just like one of the interesting things we found within it, I'm not going to go too far into it, is just that if you were over the age of 50, you were significantly less concerned about climate right. change and harm it could cause 
than if you were, let's say, under the under 50, at, like in general, and especially under 30. My, my theory is it's uh, both like the growth of just the media pushing climate change as well as the indoctrination that's just taken over the education system. But I thought that was because those people lived through, um, well, they would have been very young during the global cooling era. But again, they, they were around when that was that was actually going on. They've lived through all this and they've seen this before. That, I mean, yeah. that was that was my interesting takeaway from the whole thing. You know, going along. There's, with what there's you're a couple layout. of things going on there. There's disaster fatigue, uh, which gets set into people. I mean, they watch the news, you know, and a disaster after disaster after warning after warning. A lot of those 50 plus people live through uh, the 70s where they were talking about an ice age that never happened. And, um, you know, a lot of people have lived through all of the other, you know, disasters that the media has pushed, you know, um, that. Uh, they've talked about Y2K and AIDS and, um, you know, sea level rise and the whole whatnot. And so people tend to get in desensitized to all that stuff after a while. The, the same thing happens with weather. People in the Midwest get disaster or rather they call it warning fatigue because the National Weather Service goes absolutely berserkers sometimes during the summertime. A uh, warning for every tornado possibility and, and so forth out there. And people get just simply, they get overwhelmed with tornado watches and warnings. And they just kind of go, eh, it's another tornado warning, so what? And and so yeah. it's a real problem because uh, the one t time that they really do need to pay attention, you know, they may be ignoring it. And so disaster fatigue is a real thing that can happen from the media and from uh, the climate science people just pushing these disasters again and again and again. And the other thing that's going on is that there's been a major shift in the way education has been done in the past 50 years. It used to be people were taught to think critically. Now, a lot of kids going through school are not taught to think for themselves. They're taught what to think. And as a result, um, you know, they get this kind of a drilling into them that this is the way it's going to be. But then, then when they start maturing, they learn, hey, wait a minute, uh, it's not really happening. But the older people still have that, that critical thought process going on compared to the younger people. And so they, they kind of get the idea that, yeah, I've heard this before and it never happened. So I'm not going to worry about it. And it all boils down to the disaster fatigue thing. Yeah, uh, I've always said that um, outrage is a finite resource too. And when you claim, or just when you build up everything to be this monumental scenario, when something that actually is monumental comes, people are just going to be like, eh, they're just, they're just, you know, going crazy about nothing again. Like there is an actual uh, danger to doing that. Sterling, it actually, I actually heard you there. Are you, are you finally working? And the answer no. is no. Uh, nope. Is it working? Um, a little bit. Not of well. Yeah, Sterling. Well, we got to bring you back next week. I apologize. I know you wanted to be to be on the show. So it's just it's just not working. We'll. Uh, we'll the guy said week. last week, yeah. Texas hit. Sterling's windmill died. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to blame internet issues on a windmill problem, but even that's a stretch I'm not willing to make. Uh, that's funny. All right, Sterling. Uh, we got to we got to let you go for this week. Sorry about that. <laughs> But uh, we'll see you next time. Okay. Um, it, yeah, it's just it's just too uh, choppy. Uh, okay. So let's see. Anything else in the comments? Uh, I saw something that I did think was interesting. Or uh, I guess before we get to that, there was one more article I wanted to bring up, and it's um a C or it's a living in the worst case scenario article. I'm not sure which one of you sent this to me, but um here it is. So. Uh, wait, no, I think I clicked the wrong one. That's on me. Sorry. There we go. Are we living through climate change's worst case scenario? Um, we're a lot closer than it should be. One stand for scientists warned. Um, all well, right. if it's in the Atlantic, I automatically disqualify it. <laughs> <laughs> See, I get curious, just like how crazy is it going to be this time? But uh, I mean, let's see. The year 2018 was not an easy one for planet Earth. Sure, wind and solar energy kept getting cheaper. I, I kind of want to click on that hyperlink to see if they mentioned that it's just due to subsidies and all that, because it's not actually in terms of a market, free market perspective getting cheaper. Uh, and an electric car became America's best-selling luxury vehicle. 
but the most important metric of climatic or climatic health, the amount of heat trapping gas entering the atmosphere got suddenly and shockingly worse. In the United States, carbon emissions left back up, making their largest year over year increase since the end of the Great Recession. This matched the trend across the globe. According to two major studies, greenhouse gas emissions worldwide shot up in 2018, accelerating like a speeding freight train. Where do they one get scientist. this crap? I yeah, what is it? I don't know that. Go, I Anthony, don't please. see this at all. It just, I mean, I'm going to go to the EIA website. This doesn't make Thank any you. sense. Yeah, okay, because I, I, I'm having the same opinion as you here. It's like, I, that isn't my understanding of what's happening. But uh, yeah, grab that data so we can directly refute it live. <laughs> all right, so U.S. emissions do remain 11% below their 2007 peak. What? But that is what, well, that, true. But that is one of the few bright spots in the data. Global emissions are now higher than ever. And the 2018 statistics are all the more dismal because greenhouse gas emissions had previously seemed to be slowing or even declining, both in the United States and around the world. Um, uh, uh, yeah, once you get it, Anthony, let me know. Many all economists, right. you got it? Okay, so, all right, I, I guess um, I did find a graph here and I'm going to yep. send you a link to it, but I, I stand corrected. Um, it we did see a six percent rise in 2021 but not 2018. uh i don't know where they got that 2018 from but yeah. it's wrong um but yeah there was a six percent rise in 2021 um and i just sent you a link to it in the private chat so but for the most part for the last decade the temperature has been going down or not rather, but the uh, the carbon dioxide emissions in the United States is going down. This is from the uh, Energy Information Administration, the EIA. So we saw a jump from 2020 to 2021, but it's still less than it was uh, back in 2005, 2007 when it peaked. Yeah. Also, I mean, I wonder if that, that has anything to do with the fact that we shut the global economy down and then it started to, you know, maybe resume a little bit. So. It's not like suddenly the world is, is just like, oh, we need to emit more CO2. It's just like, okay, we're allowed to live our lives again to a small degree. Um, but the, if you actually read this article without looking at the data, and I'm glad that you did just pull up the data, they make it seem more like um, it's at all-time highs. It's rising faster than ever. Not that it's quite a bit lower than it's been. It's around 1980 levels. It seems to be on, uh, as if you gave it a trend line, decreasing overall. And uh, the United States is the country that is decreasing versus uh, other areas of the world. So I would say that they're they're writing the nar the, they're writing the narrative almost the opposite of what's actually occurring. Yeah, I don't know. You know, in in every kind of data that you plot, you're going to get minor variations that that of go course, up and down. Yes. And yeah. so this there's nothing to get alarmed about over here. Um, it, it, I, the whole point of the Atlantic article is basically moot as far as I'm concerned. Uh, they're, 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 they're wiggle watching. And, you know, we have the same thing happen with sea ice people. Some of the sea ice people go absolutely bonkers when, you know, there's a small drop, like, you know, a few percent on the sea ice month on month or something like that. And, you know, and then they use that to inflame and say, you know, it's getting worse. It's getting worse, you know, and then it bounces up again next year. It's just yep. wiggle watching. It doesn't mean anything. Yep. Right. It's the same with a lot of the climate issue. If you pull out the date range that you're looking at, all of a sudden, pretty much every metric that they can inflate when you look at it year over year, month over month, no longer looks scary at all. Yeah, I'm wondering if I can actually pull that out on this on this chart here um, quickly. If I can't, then... I don't uh, think you can on this yeah, page. I can Usually do it those reports chart. are some kind of PDF. Yeah, plus, I mean, they're not going to want to make it that easy because it would fly in the face of their narrative. <laughs> Uh, all right, so we're at the, like the the forty minute mark here. So if any of you have any questions you want us to answer, get them on screen now. Uh, Anthony, I'm I'm guessing you may have just put well, this up. Well, um, TM Willemsey, I guess is the way it pronounce it. Ask about. I have my doubts about the accuracy of CO2 measurements. Well, I can understand that. A lot of people, you know, think that maybe those aren't being measured accurately. And there was some complaints early on about the fact that the main measurement place in the for carbon dioxide is at the Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii. And this is this is up about uh, 8,000 feet, I think it is. And it's on the side of a volcano, a semi-active volcano. 
And so there's been complaints that, oh, well, they're just simply measuring CO2 from the volcano. I have a very good friend, uh, Forrest Mims III. A lot of people may know him from Radio Shack fame. He wrote a lot of books about electronics. He's a very, very good amateur scientist. And he actually did a book for NOAA on his own went to the Mauna Loa Observatory and, you know, gave it the third degree, really. He examined every measurement process there to see what they were doing and how they were doing it and whether they were doing it properly. And the answer that came back is, yes, they are doing it properly. They're making sure that they only measure on days when the wind is not blowing any emissions, possible emissions from the volcano that way. And at that point in the atmosphere, in the middle of the ocean, the, the carbon dioxide is relatively well mixed. And you can see this in the graph by the fact that we don't see any big jumps or spikes going on in the CO2 emissions year on year. If they were not measuring it in a well mixed location, you wouldn't see these giant bumps up and down. Now remember, this is this is a measurement of emissions, not of actual carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So this is yeah. an estimate based on on uh, production and things like that. This isn't an actual measurement. This is a projection based on you know how much energy has been used and how much coal has been burned and that sort of thing. So there's a difference. But um, I'm not too concerned about carbon dioxide measurements. I think they are reasonably accurate. I don't think there's any issues with them. If any issues that were brought up have been dealt with properly. And so I, I think they, they are accurate because if they didn't do that accurately, their whole the whole house of cards associated with the models and everything would fall apart. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, anything dead? Yeah. I want to mention a comment that Ivan Hunter said, where he said, please stop endorsing the CO 2s importance by even further justifying minor oh, yeah. variations in levels. We need to keep referencing the prehistoric CO 2 levels and the missing medieval warming periods, etc." And we do reference all of that when the context is appropriate. But one thing to keep in mind is that a lot of the pre prehistoric data, obviously we weren't sitting there with you know, a Hawaiian uh, monitoring station back when the dinosaurs were roaming around. Uh, so everything that we use there is based on proxies. And while some of them I'm sure are being measured as correctly as we can, you, you don't always know that our basis for how we're using our proxies is correct. So while overall trends are probably right, um, some of it might be a little deserving of skepticism for some of the old proxy data. Would you say that's fair, Anthony? Yeah, the proxy data has its problem. For example, trying to measure carbon dioxide, uh, you know, in ice core samples seems to be pretty good, uh, but they can't measure it recently because they get things like compression and all kinds of stuff. There's all kinds of problems associated with that. But every proxy has its problem. We've got no direct measurement back, you know, in the medieval warm period or, you know, time of Christ during the Roman warm period. We only have these proxies and the proxies are, you know, something like tree rings or there's something like, um, you know, protozoan, uh, diatoms, things like that. Little animals and plants that responded in a certain way. Um, the only proxy I think that really is truly accurate is uh, one that measures the ratio of oxygen 18 in the atmosphere. That one seems to be pretty good. Seems to be very reliable. But uh, so all these other ones associated with plants and animals seems to be, well, you know, they're 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 dicey sometimes, and they're dicey based on things we don't know about and dicey based on you know the way that they're trying to extract the data tree rings for example are the worst example um there's a there's a something called liebig's law of the maximum or of the minimum rather liebig's law of the minimum has to do with plant growth and basically you know people like dr michael mann seem to think that hmm. tree rings are you know god's gift to scientists well he's totally full of it because tree rings are you know measuring growth during summer seasons and up where places like Yamal in northern Russia where you know they get these short growing seasons that's where he got a lot of his tree rings from same thing from the desert southwest the problem is is that trees respond to several different things because of Liebig's law the minimum and the several different things are water sunlight carbon dioxide available nutrients and shade Okay, so all those things can affect the tree. And so if you have, uh, and, and there was some selectiveness going on on the way they picked these trees to kind of figure out the temperatures. And so they were pre-filtering some of these trees. And there was this one tree that Steve McIntyre of Climate Audit 
uh, pulled out of you know Mikey Mann's bag of tricks that he called the most <laughs> influential tree in the world, YAD061. That was the core sample. And this particular tree had these you know, tremendously different values compared to the entire other region. And of course, that those different values was what something man liked. And so he used it and he put it into the data. Well, when you take it out of the data, everything disappears <laughs> in terms of the hockey stick and all that stuff. I mean, well, not everything, but point is, is that there's, there's selectivity going on in the fact that trees don't measure temperature uniquely. They only measure what is the minimum growth going on. And so you, you just can't trust them. And that's the problem with proxies. You don't know what the tree went through. You know, you don't know what its life cycle was like. You don't know if a reindeer took a dump at the bottom of the base, or you don't know if another tree fell down and gave it more sunlight, or somebody decided they were going to have a camping you know, uh, hoot nanny down there, and they had a <laughs> bunch of campfires going, and carbon dioxide was all over the place. It made it grow better. I mean, they just don't know what the history is, and so they're making educated guesses, and a lot of times the educated guesses turn out to be wrong. Yeah, you know, we had another interesting question here. Um, it's from Fred Reitman, and it says, "Does that logarithmic relationship hold uh, true for methane and for nitrogen oxide?" I don't know. That's a that's yeah. a question I no, don't know the answer to, and it's all right not to know. I'll find out. Yeah. No. Honestly, uh, I I'm not sure. Either. Linnea, if you know, take it. If not, like uh, let's look into this for next week because that that's a that's an interesting question and and uh, it's worth addressing. I'm I'm I could not cite something off the top of my head. I'm decently sure that it does hold for methane. Not the exact same, of course, because all of okay. these have different reflected properties. Um, the issue with methane that I think we talked about last week, but the reason why methane is a suspect um, that's probably not so, not as powerful as the alarmists would make you think about um, contribution to warming or greenhouse effect or whatever you want to, whatever your preferred theory on yeah. this is. Um, it's the issue is that most of the spectrum that methane can capture is already captured by water vapor and that it has a very short lifespan in the atmosphere compared to other gases. So it really doesn't have the ability to contribute all that much compared to others, especially water vapor. Right. Yeah, and I mean, there's some, there's some historical evidence for this, you know, that one of the major, uh, doomsday scenarios that they put out is the fact that, you know, all of these peat marsh bogs and wetlands, uh, tundra, all that stuff in the north is going to melt and it's going to release all this methane and that's just going to throw the whole climate out of whack. Well, you know, we've had these warm periods in the past and methane was released in these areas and the earth did not go bazonkers overheat mm -hmm. and, you know, roast itself. They, they, they keep going towards this runaway greenhouse effect that they think is going to happen. But there's absolutely no evidence whatsoever to Earth's history that this has ever happened. And it's not likely to happen because it's just not in the cards mathematically associated with, you know, like Linnea points out, these absorp absorption spectra, just not there. Yeah, so we have another question here, uh, Jim, if you want to throw it on screen. Yeah. Is it true that temperatures had started to rise before CO2 levels started to rise? So we kind of touched on this one last week a bit, but uh, it, it, it is worth mentioning. And, and generally, uh, I guess I can take this one. Uh, there is like a correlation between temperature and CO2. Obviously, you've seen a million charts from Al Gore that's, uh, that over very broad scales of time, it's like, see, CO2 goes up, temperature goes up. What's interesting is that you actually zoom in on these charts uh, you still see that correlation, but you see that um, temperature is actually the leading factor of CO2. And this is oversimplifying the entire system, to be clear. It's, it's much more than this. But what you find is that as temperature increases, CO2 will follow. And the reasoning for that is that uh, oceans, oceans hold a massive amount of the Earth's uh, carbon dioxide within them. As oceans heat up, just like as if, uh, you know, a, a, I always describe this with soda, just like if you heat up a beer or you heat up like a can of Coke um, and then open it, more gas is going to come out. So as temperatures do increase, atmospheric CO2 concentrations will increase as a result due to increased, uh, I guess, um, um, emissions from the ocean. So, yes, it is true that temperatures uh, has start to rise. Yeah. Before CO2 Anywhere from four to eight hundred years, there's a lot. Yeah, 800. Yep. Yeah. And it's because, like you say, the oceans are warming and there's outgassing from the oceans just 
It's just that simple. And yet the, the alarmist community would have you believe that these things are perfectly in sync and they're not. Yeah. I and think, I think that the the relationship has some variation, though. There are some times where it appears that CO2 is first and then temperature, but yeah. it depends on other conditions that exist on the planet at the time. It's so you there's no way to boil the system down to temperature and CO2. And that's what we live on. Um, yeah. And that's just not the case. Yeah. I mean, I actually could not agree with that more. Like I, I'm, I'm oversimplifying in general and, and I fully would, if someone that came up to me and said like, does CO2 affect temperature? My immediate answer to be yes, of course. Now they might take that as, oh, then you agree with our entire position. It's like, well, well no, there's so much more nuance in that, which you probably have zero interest in listening to. But yeah, I, I absolutely agree with what you said here, Linnea. Uh, we got a couple more minutes. Let's see. Um, I haven't, I haven't had a chance to look. Did you, uh, if either you say anything that you want to cover um, while I browse through part of quantum physics, uh, is it? Part of I can imagine that that's true because uh, just because of the way that light works in general, no one gas blocks all uh, wavelengths, and uh, it can only go so far. So if you only block certain wavelengths and you keep stacking it, you can't. You can't block other wavelengths except for a very small fudging, like smudging effect that might occur. Um, you're still going to be blocking the same wavelength. So once that's all done, like I've heard it explained as either drawing down uh, sheer curtain panels over a window. Yeah. At a certain point, you can't, you're not going to block any more light from that mm -hmm. curtain panel. You have to go over to another window and start pulling down curtain panels to darken a room. Um yeah, I'm so that makes to, sense to me. You know, I wish I could say it made sense to me, and I I love quantum physics, but I don't know on this one. Uh, it's God world, God's world. Leave us alone. Uh, you know, we're still gonna discuss it. True story, Gary. Five. Um, temperature, ice cores, which way? Uh, we live. Actually, I I like this. We live within a complex system that we try to reduce down to a simple system with little success. Yep, that is the that is the the quickest way to explain what's going on in climate change uh, today. Um, all right. I'm not seeing any others right now. Uh, if, if I don't quickly pick up on one or if neither of you have one, um, Anthony, I know you got a screaming baby behind you and it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's Murphy's Law. I'm, I'm in the lobby of this hotel, right? And <laughs> I, I, I spent I spent an hour getting everything ready. And of course, literally the moment the broadcast started, someone sat down <laughs> with a screaming kid in the lobby. I love that you just referenced Murphy's Law there, by the way. That's great. Um, all right. Uh, uh, let's, uh, let's wrap it up then. Before I do, let me just get the music going because that's the best part. All right. Thank you for joining Climate Change Roundtable. We are live every Friday, usually with four of us, but Sterling's internet needs to be fixed. So we will try to get that next week. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't I don't have too much to add. Uh, Anthony, where can where can our followers uh, find you? Keep up to date with what you're doing. No, got nothing to say other than uh, we, we hope to be able to have Sterling back next week. Yep. And uh, Anthony runs what's up with that.com. It's a, a great website to go to just to, I mean, I, I think, as you say, it's like the most visited climate website in the world. And you have a counter on there of like the number of people that go, I think just as a way to kind of piss off the alarmist that, that like, no, people do look at what we do. So uh, check out what's up with that.com. It's, it's a great resource. Linnea, um, how can our followers keep up with you? You are muted, Linnea. I'm on Twitter at Linnea Lucan, uh, and also you can find some of the work that we do at climaterealism.com. Yeah, awesome. And then uh, for me, um, I just put out a new video on our, our YouTube channel. It's about a, a poll that busts the whole 97% uh, you know, narrative that, that all scientists think climate change is primarily anthropogenic and catastrophic. Uh, we, we want this video to go everywhere. It's just because this is the narrative that they've used to push uh, so much policy on us for a decade now. So check out the YouTube channel, check out the video and, and like, please share it with everyone you can. Cause um, we need, uh, we end that narrative. We, that that's their main thing. It's the consensus point and we need to end the consensus point. But uh, all right, we'll catch you all next week. Thank you for joining us. Uh, peace. <laughs>